Welcome, everyone. We had 90 people that are registered for today's seminar. Today is the second in a series of six um, webinars sponsored by the Food Co-op Initiative. My name is Marilyn Scholl, and I'm the manager of CDS Consulting Co-op. And on behalf of myself and Stuart Reed with the Food Co-op Initiative, who could not be with us today, I want to welcome you and thank you for coming and wish you the best in your project. Our presenters today are Bill Gessner and Jeannie Wells. Bill has 20 years experience as a consultant specializing in expansion and growth of existing co-ops and in the development of new co-ops. We're very excited that this spring Bill Gessner will be inducted into the Co-op Hall of Fame, the highest honor that can be bestowed by the food co-op community but on any individual. And congratulations, Bill. We're so proud of you. Our other presenter is Jeannie Wells. Uh, Jeannie has 15 years of experience working in retail consumer-owned food cooperatives. Uh, she's a consultant with CDS Consulting Co-op, specializing in co-op operations, expansions, and startups. Uh, so again, thank you for coming, and hope we, hopefully we'll see you again uh, at the next four seminars each of the next four Tuesdays. So take it away, Bill. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or mornings for some people and maybe evenings for others. But um, welcome, and it's uh, great that you can be with us today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be, um, again, presenting a webinar and, and having some interaction with uh, you either through questions or follow-up after our webinar. Uh, this webinar is a follow-up of, of last week's webinar around creating a vision and building a shared vision. We're going to focus on the topic of creating alignment. And uh, we, our, basic, our agenda is rather basic here. Uh, the first half an hour or so, we will go through some uh, materials, presentations, maybe taking a question or two. Uh, Joel will be fielding the questions. And uh, then we will have more time for discussion and questions in the, in the second half of our hour. Uh, today, um, I'm really pleased that Jeannie Wells is joining me. And Jeannie, I'd like you to say hello and uh, uh, tell us a little bit of something that you'd like to share. OK. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Jeannie Wells. Uh, as Marilyn said, I've been working with food co-ops um, since the mid-90s. I was a general manager um, of a of a co-op that went through several expansions. Um, and then since then, I've been working with co-ops around the country, most recently with CDS, uh, focusing a lot on um, growth and expansion, both with existing co-ops and with startups. So it's a pleasure to be here talking with Bill and all of you. Thank you, Jeannie. And we also have a special guest with us today. Um, who has some great first-hand experience around this topic, uh, Ben Sandell from the Friendly City Food Co-op in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, ben? Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here and glad to be uh, trying to pass along a little bit of what uh, we went through to help out other co-ops that are coming up. Great. And Ben, you uh, will will get into more about your co-op uh, a little bit later on. But your co-op opened. Uh, tell me, what, June June sixth. June sixth of year. Yep. Of what year, Ben? Oh, I'm sorry, of 2011. Okay. So uh, you passed. The, you survived at least six months. Correct. Yeah, that's great. And uh, anyway, and you your your role, Ben, was. Uh, has been primarily what during that time of the um, I was the board president throughout the pretty much the whole process um, and uh, yeah so I guess I guess I was in a leadership role there yes okay great well thank you Ben we'll get to you a little bit later here great uh, the desired outcome today is to have uh, that you leave the webinar with a greater understanding of some key items here, uh, how to develop a system for moving through the four cornerstones and three stages model for startup food co-ops. Some, for some of you, this model may be new. Others are a little bit familiar with it or deeply familiar with it. 
but we do offer this model as a guideline um, for your co-op uh, and, and as a structure of sorts to help you move through the startup phase. Uh, we will look at how to create a work plan and a checklist for each stage of your project. And hopefully you'll end up with greater understanding of the dynamics involved in building alignment uh, within your co-op through the startup process and beyond. Um, you know, how can you create realistic expectations, excitement, and organizational alignment in your, in your cooperative and stay focused on the right priorities throughout the process? So that's what we're aiming for, is to help you get, gain a greater understanding of those items. Um, again, the four cornerstones and three stages model. On one hand, it's, it's very simple, but it, it can be challenging to apply to your, to your startup project. Um, by definition, I've found over the years that all co-ops, all either startup co-ops, um, or even existing food co-ops that are going through an expansion project, they will resist this model. And it is your job as leaders of the co-op to take the special uniqueness that your project is and bring it in to this model. And the model functions in a sense as a container for your, for your co-op as you're going through the both the birthing process and the, you know, the getting to the point of opening your store and beyond. We emphasize four cornerstones that are important in all stages of the project, from beginning um, up until year 50 and beyond. So those are shown here: the the, the cornerstone of vision, the cornerstone of talent cornerstone of capital, and the cornerstone of systems. Um, there's more detailed information about this model on other webinars that you can have access to. But it is important to kind of think of these four cornerstones and perhaps assess your effort at every point along the way and saying, how are you doing in terms of strengthening these cornerstones that provide a foundation for your for your co-op. Within the space uh, created by the cornerstones, we show three stages. Stage one, organizing. Stage two, feasibility and planning. And stage three, implementation. So another way to look at this, again, is the showing it in a, in a little different fashion. Uh, you see that there are sub-stages in stage two, and even more sub-stages in stage three. So it gets a little complex the further you go along. The, the um, dotted line represents a very important decision point at the end of stage 2B, where you have secured your site with contingencies. And your site is then you're able to go public with what that site is. And at that point, you would conceivably have reached a certain goal for a number of members. Uh, so that decision point represented by the dotted line, uh, extremely important point to reach. Once you cross over that, you begin to commit even greater resources and move your project along in terms of design and financing primarily. And you reach a place where there's, you see the line between stage 3A and 3B, where at that point you have everything brought together of all the financing, both internally and externally. And the design process is complete, and you have firm bids on all the costs involved. If all of this comes together to a point where you can remove the contingencies in your lease agreement or purchase agreement, and then you cr once you cross over that solid line, there's no turning back. So being aware of those two decision points and how they factor into your project and understanding 
the importance of both of them and realizing that solid line is the key decision point. Another way to look at this, and uh, looks like our, our line jumped a little bit here in this version, uh, but the setting thresholds for number of members to uh, as a way to help demonstrate the interest and commitment of your community to see this project through. So these number, the, the number of members that you set is, is not carved in stone here, but what we're suggesting for a store size of uh, 6,000 square feet, uh, total size, maybe two-thirds of that would be retail. And looking at these number of members, uh, getting to 1,000 members before opening. And people ask, well, if our store is only 2,000 square feet, how many members do we need? Can we divide it by three? And I say, I wouldn't do that. I would really encourage you to keep as close to these numbers as possible. Uh, certainly, a very small store could be less. But uh, I would look at exceeding these numbers in, in, all, in most all cases. So, so that's an overview of the quick overview of the four cornerstones and three stages. But then we get to something that's very key beginning in the organizing stage, and that's looking at the, the vision that is evolving in your organization. And we discussed this quite thoroughly last week in the first webinar of this series. But as you begin to develop a shared vision, built out of your own individual visions, the question of alignment becomes comes into play. As roles begin to develop uh, within your leadership group or your core group or your founding team, um, is there alignment? Is there alignment within the board of directors? Is there alignment between the board of directors and the different working groups? However, you're describing or naming the, the groups in your organization. Um, so we talked a little bit before about maybe at the beginning you have everyone has their own individual vision and as you work towards a shared vision you're moving perhaps from a 20% shared vision out of all the individual visions to at least an 80% shared vision. So this movement in the direction from 20 to 80 represents the alignment that evolves as you move forward. Uh, we see some groups, some startup groups that have that don't get to the 80 percent level. Uh, that they have differences um, in their groups, ranging from, um, let's say, some startup co-ops are wanting to open their doors you know, in two months rather than take the, the timeline that is suggested in this process. And maybe they even want to open early as a buying club. And you know, some of those things are options, but, but, they, but they, in a lot of groups, we see groups trying to, they sometimes become divided around these issues. And so in that case, there's, not, there's a lack of a shared vision and there's a lack of alignment. So what does alignment mean? When I, when I first heard the word uh, used in reference to food co-ops, I really didn't know what it meant. And uh, so beginning to figure that out, uh, looking at a definition of alignment here um, on this slide, yeah. but the alignment really refers to people come together, coming together and pointing in the same direction working effectively towards a common vision or goal. Is there alignment within the board? Um, is, is, if there's a project manager or general manager, is there alignment between the board and management? If you don't have management in place, is there alignment between the board and the work groups? Without such alignment, your co-op will be if it quickly become if it isn't already dysfunctional. Uh, so we'll work to achieve that alignment.
this doesn't happen overnight, in my experience. Uh, building alignment is a process that takes time. Um, and it is something that you can stop occasionally and discuss as a group and saying, are you all aligned? Are you on the same page? Are you moving in the same direction? Are you increasingly building a shared vision? Uh, remember that it's important not to think you have to figure all this out at the very beginning of your process because as you move forward you'll be learning you'll be studying and learning a lot and your vision will shift and change uh, you will have to decide if you if it's shifting and changing too much from your original vision uh, are your core values or basic values being threatened by a new direction or is it that you're just learning some of the realities that you have to deal with or settle for, or some of the opportunities that you hadn't seen initially. And as you begin seeing these new things, can your group go forward together in, in what I would call a fluid manner, uh, rather than in a rigid manner? Uh, can, you be, can you have some degree of flexibility while staying true to your core values? This is something that the fine line in each group has to sense that out and figure out where that is for them. I really recommend both with building a shared vision and building alignment that you strengthen yourselves at the core before reaching out into your membership and community, that you become aligned around a shared vision, working it in, and then building from the inside and going out. So that, that's just an overview, and we'll get into some things a little bit more specific to each of the stages. Uh, what are the priorities of each of the stages? And we'll look at that a little bit later. But I want to uh, turn it over to Jeannie and have her uh, share a few things from her experience around this question of alignment and vision. Jeannie? OK. Um. Well, so just adding on to this, um, what Bill's talking about, a unified vision. And I know some of you attended the workshop last week. Um, but I thought I would restate how important um, having a unified vision is and really knowing what it is you're trying to build. Um, there's, I think in today's market, there are a lot of options for food co-ops and a lot of different directions you can go. So really getting a lot of alignment with your core board or your core group uh, initially on what it is you're, you're wanting to do uh, will serve you well as you go through the next you know, couple of years as you explore this. Um, there are a lot of different priorities that will emerge. And I think it's good advice, what Bill said about being flexible because they will ebb and flow, and you, they will become more crystal clear as you move through it. Um, on the next slide, Bill, mm -hmm. um, it's just what I when I think of some of the challenges that come up, particularly in startups, and in having a clear idea on what you're trying to build. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, some people will will really be advocating for a neighborhood store. It needs to be a neighborhood store at, at reasonable prices. Um, and, and that may be the most important thing to a group of the founding members. Uh, another group of founding members may uh, be really advocating for more of a community gathering place or a, a place for farmers, local farmers, to sell their food. So there, sometimes those different ideals um, compete uh, in while you're trying to form your your alignment and refine your vision um, on the next one though how, how do you get one of those beach balls yeah I know <laughs> it's pretty great mm -hmm. I, that I'd wasn't like, taken out of food co-op <laughs> I'd like to sign up for one um, so on the next one you know this is is really trying to reconcile some of those initial hopes and, and dreams you have for your co-op with as you move through this, 
um, and finding out more about the, the market that you'll be operating in and, and how does that inform the vision of, of you know, what you're trying to do. I think um, particularly with food co-ops that are starting, um, and it may start as from a board and then transition to a general manager or project manager, um, you know, it's really important to sort of pass that vision on and, and have it codified and, and be able to state it to the people that you start bringing in. Um, I, I worked with a food co-op earlier this year that was starting up and this process was um, a, a little bit of a challenge just as the you know, manager coming on site and, and this particular co-op was very adamant about um, wanting you know, a big sign on their building that said um, affordable food for everyone and then once the manager came in and was trying to keep these commitments to local farmers and realizing that quality food costs more and um, really trying to reconcile that, you know, trying to offer this high quality food, it may not be the cheapest food, so, um, you know, advertising it as the most affordable food became a problem for them and they, they really had to work through this um, in, in their market, which was a um, more urban setting and, and price was a, a big issue. And so just really, you know, as you move through this process, be really aware of what the, um, you know, the competition for these different ideals is going to be. If you're, if you're really, if your vision is very much on whole foods and no packaged food, but you're, you know, in a marketplace where there's a high premium on convenience, um, you know, that will make you really look at, at your product mix um, as well price, you know, and, and every market is a little different. So just, you know, how how are you going to work together as a group and then also as you bring in more people to keep the priorities really focused on what's important to you and what you're trying to do. Um, Bill, if you can go to the next one. It's just um, this idea of having a compass of what are the essential priorities that, um, that you are trying to achieve. Um, and and just keep refining those as you go. My experience working with startups and existing food co-ops that are going through a large expansion is you start out with a pretty good set of what you're trying to achieve, and then once you get closer to you know identifying a site um, and then start in the design process, a lot of options seem to to come up. Um, usually from well-meaning people, you know, sometimes there's just good ideas that come up and trying to have a way to um, evaluate those as they come up. If you're looking for a site, for example, and uh, you come across a site that has a, a large bakery that's right next door that maybe they want you to take over the management of that, you know, is that part of your vision? How do you, how do you decide if that's a good idea or not a good idea? Or um, you know, a lot of times the site conditions can really make you look at a lot of different options. So being clear on what the essential purpose that you're trying to do uh, will help you get through those. Also, once you get into construction, sometimes, you know, options, uh, good or bad, uh, can arise. And, you know, so sometimes having a general contractor coming to you and saying, hey, we could, you know, we could put a full basement underneath the store and it would get, you know, how do you decide? Is that the priority for us right at this time? You know, so being really clear as you can going in here and um, having a clearly stated, like, set of objectives you're trying to accomplish, I think, will help the best. Once you, as it starts to move um, through these phases and you're getting closer to construction, um, I really believe that restating the purpose of the project or the store or however you need to frame it um, is really important and it's important not just for, uh, I mean it's important to remind each other, it's important as the staff is coming on, it's really important that they know what the priorities are. Um, it, it gives you a way to talk to the local press which will be very interested in what you're doing. So. You know, being really clear on, well, we're really trying to you know, open a new marketplace for local farmers. We're trying to create a great working environment for our staff or, you know, or whatever, whatever they are. Being able to speak clearly 
um, about what it is you're trying to do will will serve everyone. It'll serve it'll serve the organization um, in every direction by being able to be focused on your your you know four or five clean priorities that you're trying to accomplish. So it's I think it's hard for existing co-ops. I think it's challenging for startup co-ops too. Um, so just you know, be mindful of the need to keep it clear and in front of you all the time. Great. Bill? Thank you, Jamie. Um, so I think those are really some, some good comments um, in terms of the maintaining clarity on your priorities. Um, you know, so if, if you're at the very beginning, at the organizing stage, or if you've been at it for a year or two and are further along in the timeline, um, even doing some self-assessment or group assessment, you know, are you are you still are are you building energy and enthusiasm as you're going along? Are you are you staying true to your core values and your original? purpose, the original need that you were trying to address, uh, all the while integrating all the new things that you're learning, uh, the new opportunities, the new threats, uh, the risks that you're learning more about. Uh, all You will be challenged uh, significantly as you, as you move forward. Um, so these are some good comments. Um, ben uh, Sandel, Ben. Uh, I also wanted to mention that Ben will be participating in a, in a couple of other webinars, and we'll show you those at the end of the session. But uh, you'll be able to. It's, it's worth, I think, learning a little bit about the story of Friendly City Food Co-op, and uh, Ben will be able to uh, give us a little bit more of a picture of that. So, Ben. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, as you can see on this slide, in April of 2006. Uh, there was a small, kind of very tiny health food store that was failing here in Harrisonburg, Virginia, which is a community of about 42,000 people in our city with another 60 or so thousand in the surrounding area uh, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Um, and the, the people who owned this little store were really interested in finding someone who might save it. And a group of us thought about converting it into a cooperative. But we looked at, uh, and I would add, most of the people who were interested in doing that were transplants from other communities that we'd lived with co-ops and uh, really enjoyed them, but moved here and didn't have one. But we looked at the finances of the little store, and we created a very rudimentary vision for what we would want our co-op to be like and realize that these weren't going to fit together at all. So, and I guess uh, I would say that would be our first, um, if completely uh, subconscious, our first experience with alignment, where we realized we did not have an alignment there, that running that very small store was never going to help us accomplish or get to our kind of rudimentary vision for what we wanted out of our co-op. So we started organizing. and. Uh, meeting pretty aimlessly, and then we discovered uh, the the first edition of the How to Start a Food Co-op booklet, and especially we found the, the uh, Four Cornerstones and Three Stages model, which really clicked with us. Um, I think we were fortunate that our initial group was very focused on learning and figuring out what we wanted this to be, and we really wanted to open a grocery store. A, a cooperative grocery store. So we definitely had challenges throughout of uh, refining that and understanding the scale that we were comfortable with and dealing with all the aspects that you have to deal with as a group. Um, but I, I think we were pretty lucky that we had a fair amount of alignment from the get-go. Um, we were hoping to get it open much sooner, but of course there were some major financial changes in the country that occurred pretty much in the middle of our process. Um, we also were originally hoping to open about a 10,000 square foot store, and that's what our market study was based on. However, we looked at what the cost of that was and the challenge of raising that money, and we got cold feet and scaled it back to about 
6,100 or 6,000 square feet was the target. Um, so we proceeded from there. We we followed that uh, the four cornerstones in particular were really key to us because as a group, especially when things were going well, we get really excited and people would come up with a new idea and it'd be, you know we think, well, that's a fantastic idea. However, do we have the people? Do we have the money? Do we have the vision? Do we have the system to do that? Uh, or is it going to take away from our true vision of opening a cooperative grocery store? And that was a really good way for us to keep focused and to keep from getting too distracted or going off on tangents. Um, and also, I think having that, uh, having the three stages, we were always able to loop back in wherever, at whatever stage we were at, if we were losing motivation or focus, we would circle back, look at where we were, look at what was next to accomplish. Um, it made it so that we weren't in moments of tension, we weren't looking at each other. We were looking back at the plan to see how do we proceed forward. Um, we hired our general manager in June of 2010, but he had to relocate and wrap up what he was doing at the time. So he didn't actually arrive on scene till more like September, uh, late September, I think. Um, so by that time, we already had a lot of the plan, the the plan for the uh, interior for, for the store layout in place, but he definitely weighed in on that and helped make changes um, and refine that and make that better. We ended up opening this past June, uh, June 2011, the 6th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a really great moment. And uh, things have been going pretty well since then. As with any store, you know, there are ups and downs, any new opening, but we've survived six months and uh, are, I think, doing OK and on a good path. Um, so that's our, that's our story to date. Bill, is there anything else you'd like me to add? Well, I, I think this is really good for a good picture to look at here. Uh, as I understand it, your sales are, 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 are a little bit running a little bit below that projected amount for the first year. Uh, we're, we're running a, a little bit below that. Uh, that's true. We're a little below projection that way. Um, however, there we are. We are seeing a pretty steady growth curve, uh, and we also started out. We refined our pro forma a number of times throughout our process, and we ended up opening the store with slightly less debt than we forecast. And we've managed to, I think. Uh, by the very good luck of having a, a great general manager, our margin is a little higher than we forecast, and our overhead has also been a little lower than forecast. So although we'd certainly like to see those the sales numbers get to our projections, we're uh, doing a little better in other areas. So overall, our cash picture is still reasonably good. Um, I mean, it's something we're watching closely, but we're, I guess I'd say, guardedly happy, guardedly optimistic about it all. Sure. So I think that's uh, it's a great accomplishment by all of you. And you look at the five-year period of time that you worked on it, you uh, have a few pictures here that uh, show. I yeah, the, the, the picture on the left is right out of our market study, and it shows our space before we were there. Um, it's a downtown location at a good corner. Um, it had been a grocery store about 30-something years ago, but since then it had been empty and a disco and a restaurant and a bar and most recently a gym and tanning salon. Um, the picture on the right is midway through construction. You can see there's a lot of rust on the exterior column. There's a sign on the roof of the building that we were planning on using that ended up getting condemned, so that crane is in the process of pulling it off. Um, so the the building had some good aspects. Uh, it was not our first choice space, but uh, once we did our market study, we learned that this was definitely a superior location to what we considered our first choice. So you know, there's a case of realignment, where we had gotten really aligned around this particular location that we fell in love with. And then our market study said, well, that location would be like a C plus. So we had to really think about that and discuss as a group how we felt about that. But we also learned a lot uh, by reading the market study and going through the process of it. And I think that learning 
you know, that you, you want to have a really clear vision. You also want to hold it somewhat loosely so that as you learn more, you can adjust accordingly. So once we learned why, like for instance, the previous location, one of the streets it was on was a one-way street. It was going to make it very challenging for trucks to get in and out. This one, this location has much better visibility, much better access, both for the customers and for the suppliers. Um, and this is what it looks like tonight. Um, so after the renovations, after paint, after everything else, it's a nice, bright, cheery spot. We won a really wonderful design award from our city as the nicest, uh, the, the basically the best redo of a building for that year. Um, so yeah, it's a real transformation of that corner. Great. So uh, a few of the challenges that you had been uh, maybe taking just a, a minute here just to uh, talk briefly about these, and then we should take some questions. OK. Um, yeah, very briefly, our first real big challenge, when we began meeting, we called ourselves a founding team. And this was pre-incorporation. When we incorporated, of course, we then had a legal responsibility to have a board, and which we did. But there were people who were part of the founding team who were not on the board. And we functioned that way with two kind of parallel groups for a while. But tension was building, and the board realized that you know we were taking all the, re the legal responsibility and the fiduciary responsibility, and our names were on all the paperwork. But there was also this founding team that was doing a lot of similar work in that there were concerns there. Uh, and I would say there were, in terms of alignment, it was a real challenge keeping these two groups from overlapping, from you know, using our precious energy unwisely by doing the same things. Um, and we, for that particular challenge, we used an outside organization uh, group here in town that does business mediation and, and uh, board development services. And we used them for a retreat at, that helped us get back to our vision and get ourselves realigned again where we were aboard with committed volunteers. But at that point, everyone understood better where they wanted to be and, and uh, moved where was appropriate, uh, whether they were working on a committee, a board committee, or whether they were not working on a committee, but we're out there as volunteers to be called on. Um, so that was a, a major growing up moment. Um, principal financing, especially given the, the financial situation and the economic situation in the country, that was a big challenge. Uh, but we, went, we were very outcome based on that in that we knew where we wanted to get to with that. We knew different avenues to get there, and we worked diligently. And, uh, the least likely but most amazing one came through for us, and uh, although I guess it's less unusual than we thought, um, but it worked. Uh, and we, we really asked our community directly to take an active role in that. So there we were building alignment with our community members and our members of saying, you know, if you have a relationship with a bank, talk to them about financing us. If you are a person who could consider financing us yourselves, please consider it. Um, and then lastly, the site contingencies. I think all all new co-ops have a variety. You know, our, one of ours was that our landlord was unwilling to break our space down from 10,000 feet to 6,000 feet unless we found the co-tenant for it. Uh, so again, we created alignment in our community uh, by asking directly and saying, if you know someone who could use 4,000 square feet at about this price, talk to us. And uh, eventually, we did find that co-tenant who we are happily co-leasing co with now. Um, but they, of course, have a, have a shorter lease. So hopefully, when the time comes, we'll have first right to that space, and we can use that for future expansion. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to move us along here a little bit and uh, yep. see if we have some questions. And then we'll get into looking at the priorities for each of the stages. Uh, Joel? Yeah, we do have a, a couple questions for Ben, specifically regarding his experience with Friendly City. Um, we've got two questions here from uh, Patrick Reagan of the Arroyo Food Co-op in Altadena, California. He wants to know uh, what percentage of members were fully invested at the time of opening. And um, the second part of his question is, where did the rest of your financing come from? 
Um, sure, I can answer those pretty briefly. Uh, if by fully invested, I think I'm under, I'm interpreting that to mean how many had fully paid the two hundred dollar member share price, uh, and right. I would say probably about uh, I am. We kept track every month as to how many shares we had and how many were still to be paid for or had some amount that was unpaid. We probably had 30 or 40 shares that people were still making payments on or that were partially paid. We were pretty diligent about contacting people and saying, you know, it's fine if you can only do $25 every other month, but we would appreciate you do that. Uh, so we, it was, a, I think, a fairly low number were not fully paid. Uh, if you mean taking part in the member loan campaign, that was more like 220 of our members uh, loaned us money through the member loan campaign. And the bulk of our financing came from a combination of the 200 and something thousand dollar equity uh, from the member shares and um, about $670,000 from our member loan campaign uh, and another 500 and almost 70 like 580000 that we borrowed as our principal financing that came from a local private individual. Okay, great. Another question, Joel? Uh, sure. Uh, we have a question from Allison Einerson, who's from the Wasatch Cooperative Market. Um, Allison wants to know, what would you say were the keys to getting your first 300 member owners? Uh, well, I, uh, I think um, alignment went a long way with that, and by that I mean we uh, we kind of fanned out. That is, the members of the board took different areas, and uh, we talked to every group we could. So we told the story that we were envisioning for this store. We tried to communicate our vision as best we could um, to Rotary clubs, Ruritan clubs, uh, every and any group we could get in front of, we talked to, and we also asked at every single group, you know, at, at, you know, ask every, everyone there, would you please consider joining today? I have the materials here. I'm happy to take a check today from you or start the paperwork process. So we really asked a lot. We put the word out there. We tried to create alignment in the community. Um, at first, it was slower, and we heard a lot of feedback from people, both positive and negative, which was great. It gave us a lot more to think about and a way to refine our message and our vision. And we kept asking. We did all kinds of events in the community, um, a lot of legwork. We did also hire an outreach coordinator who was a person who handled a lot of the logistical piece of signing up members and also helped find different speaking engagements and keep us organized and focused. And many of us had day jobs in addition to working on the co-op. Good. Um, that's a very good question, and it kind of leads us into kind of taking a look at, at stage one. And the slide that I'm showing here now is, I, I emphasize that this is a very rough draft of uh, things that might be part of stage one, the organizing stage, and that you can begin to view these kind of priority items as a checklist of sorts. And that you can work your way through this checklist. These aren't necessarily sequential, but they might be somewhat sequential. Um, and your again, your project is unique and special, and there will be additional things that you would want to include on this checklist, appropriate to your situation, appropriate to the strategy that you're dealing with. But the idea is to not jump ahead and and in stage one, for example, you wouldn't want to say sign a lease on the space down the street that's available now but is going to be rented in two months. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to do that in stage one. Uh, that's jumping ahead and getting out of sequence in a, in a fundamental way that's going to you know, really bring greater risk to your project in 99 out of 100 situations. So again, using this three-stage model as a container of sorts, a structure uh, where you can begin saying, OK, these are the key steps that we need to take. 
And once you develop that, you begin to say, okay, how are we going to do these? Who is going to do these things? And you can get more specific, certainly, than what I have listed here. Uh, and as you begin to create a, a work plan using the three-stage template as a, as, a, as a template to work within, you can create greater detail and you can show who uh, I really recommend if, you, if you're going to have a, you know, some work groups or committees that you not try to have 17 different work groups, but maybe three, and really do some planning work around what the purpose of, what the charter of each of those work groups might be, who will be the chair of that, and some groups say, well, we're all, we're all going to do this together. Nobody has time to be the chair. And typically that results in unmet expectations. Uh, but if you have a designated chairperson, at least even to begin and convene the group, uh, and then maybe it might get uh, evolved and somebody else might take that on by month two or month three, for example. Uh, but to be clear that there would be somebody leading each work group and that there would be some coordination of the work groups and some reporting and some accountability there. So all of that is built into um, to stage one. And we could even list, we could add to this list here. This Again, this is an imperfect checklist. We could add something about um, designing a a process, an effective process for the core group. You know, um, if you're going to work on consensus or if you're going to work on a modified form of consensus or, you know, how is it you're going to work together? Um, there, are, there are a lot of different options for that. So these are some things to look at as part of stage one. And again, I emphasize this is a very rough draft. And we work with some of the startup groups and we will work with them on what we call kind of timeline management and where you can, where we'll see either we'll work with them to create a draft of this or if they do a draft, we'll critique and review that with them and offer some suggestions and perspective on that. So moving on here uh, to stage 2A, uh, the feasibility stage where you're kind of systematically even in stage one, you've done some very preliminary feasibility work, but by the time you get to stage 2A, uh, then you're going to be doing your more serious feasibility work. Some groups choose to do a market study and a financial performa back in stage one, um, but I tend to refer to that as preliminary feasibility assessment, uh, even though it might be the formal, the formal type, but some, in many cases that the financial performer is going to need further work as you go into the feasibility stage. Uh, the market study, as you get closer to securing a site, might require an update. Uh, so these type of things more seriously happen in stage two. But we see that by the end of stage one, with 300 members in this case, and the incorporation, the bio, the board of directors, the membership drive, we now have an organization. But stage 2A, again, testing the feasibility for that. Um, and at the end of stage 2A, membership continues to build, reaching 450 members. Uh, you are able to assess the overall feasibility for your preferred direction and your preferred site or sites. And you can kind of say, yes, we, it looks good from a market feasibility point. On a, on a scale of 0 to 10, for example, you might give it an 8. In your internal readiness, you're beginning to look at your capacity, your assembling of talent. Uh, how are you working together? How are you building your capacity? How are you developing your leadership? Um, maybe you're going to give yourself a, a 5 on a scale of 0 to 10. Uh, financial feasibility, uh, these, there's some very strong challenges there. Maybe your initial performa doesn't look so good. Maybe that's a four. Uh, maybe you've done some preliminary design feasibility around either a specific site or just generically what type of store do you envision. And so that might be 
that might look good, and maybe that's an 8 or a 9 or something. But you integrate all of these different aspects of feasibility into one overall assessment and say, are we going in the right direction? Do we want to invest further resources, money, and time to go into stage 2B, uh, where you begin to develop your business plan, you do the planning work, and then you implement for the hiring of a general manager. Uh, it can be very difficult to hire a general manager at this early stage. Uh, we recommend that they be hired between 6 and 12 months before store opening. Uh, the, the closer to 12 months, the better. I think with Friendly City, it looks like it was about 8 or 9 months that the general manager was on site before the store opened. And so, but moving through stage 2B, things are getting more serious. Uh, the site search process is, is well underway. You have sites that you're ranking as your preferred site plan A, but you are, don't put all your eggs in that basket. You're also looking at what would you do if plan A didn't exist? What would your preferred site be then? Uh, the negotiations for the site begin. You also are building your members, increasing, let's say, from 450 to 600 members. So by the time you would secure a site with a lease agreement or a purchase agreement, at the end of stage 2B, uh, securing a site with contingencies, you will, have, you will be up to 600 members. You will have worked your way through a checklist, and there will probably be another five or ten items that you would add specific to your situation. Stage 3A, preparing for construction, renovation. Primary work you do there is the design work and then the financing work, getting your financing internally and external together. With all the financing in place tied to final bids, if you can bring that together, you move on to closing your deal, removing all the contingencies. This is where you cross over the solid line, the final decision point, the no turning back. So these, this system of moving through the three stages where you create checklists specific to your co-op and your situation and your group that is working on this, and you develop an effective process for working through and being able to check these off. If you have a checklist of 15 items for stage one and you've completed 13 of them and you have gotten to 300 members and you've incorporated and you've done some of the basic things, but you haven't done everything on that checklist, well, maybe you still move into stage 2A but you take those leftover items and make sure you address them early on in stage 2A. Uh, I really encourage you to avoid the, the approach where you say, well, we're kind of in stage 1 and we're kind of in stage 2A and, and we're, doing, we're kind of in stage 3. Um, I'd say you're, you're in only one of these stages or substages at a time. But if you use that approach, that will be a lot better way to move through the model. So, Joel, I want to see if we have another question. We, we do. We have uh, several questions, probably more than we have time for. Um, but I have one here from Sydney Null from the Makem Food Co-op in Makem, Illinois. Um, Sydney asks, uh, I'm part of a startup co-op that is still in the organizing phase. How set should our priorities be at this point? We still need many more owners. Should they be contributing to and editing our priorities, or should we appeal to potential owners with a solid vision? Well, I would kind of say that you build your strength at the core. Uh, I don't know how many member owners co-op has at this point, but or I don't know how many, and then I don't know how many are in the, what I would call the core group, but I think you need to get to 
core, build your core group, maybe it's initially three or five or seven people, but I think you need to get it to the point where there are maybe 15 or 20 people that are actively engaged in some type in the process and contributing to what I would call in a broad way to the leadership of the co-op. And it's with that group, and it's not, not saying that all 20 of those people meet all the time together, but they're a close-knit, aligned group. Uh, and with that, that group should be wrestling with their process. How are we going to get to the end of stage one? What are our priorities? What is the timeline for achieving those that is reasonable? Do we need outside assistance to help us sift through these and work through some of these priorities? Uh, that's an approach I would take rather than going out to your full community or your full membership. Uh, if you go out to your full membership and have an informational meeting, I think it's to try to recruit people into your, your leadership group. Uh, that would be you know, in addition to just promoting what you're trying to do, but you would also be trying to attract talented and committed people into your leadership group. Um, we do we do have another question. Let's take one more question and then we will probably we'll maybe hear one more thing from Jeannie. She might have another thought and uh, I bet she has many, but we'll give her one more thought, but let's have a question and have Jeannie comment on the question. Great. This one comes from Kevin Edberg from Cooperative Development Services. Kevin asks, can you distinguish the roles of a project manager in helping a volunteer board or a steering committee, uh, particularly in growing initial membership and a project manager that is hired to bring the store to opening? Different skills, compensation, full-time versus part-time. Sure, I'll comment on that briefly, and I'll ask Jeannie to comment a bit. But there's the role of project management um, varies in every situation, and it may be that you want to hire, and I would recommend it if you certainly can, to hire man project management in your in the organizing stage or towards the end of the organizing stage to, to help you further your organizing effort, whether that be to lead a membership drive or whether that be to coordinate your your leadership group in a, in a fuller fashion than any of your leadership group people are able to do. Uh, that position might be, may not be full time, it might be half time. Um, as you move towards a site, you may want to, and if you haven't been able to hire a general manager, you may want to have a site, a project manager who's duties are more site and facilities based, maybe helping coordinate the site search, maybe taking a lead role in the site negotiations and in the design process. So each leadership group should do kind of an inventory of the skills they have and that they don't have, and that helps influence what your hiring needs are. But I think uh, Ben at Friendly City would comment that when they they hired some people in some coordinating fashions, not necessarily a full project manager early on, once they started to hire and empower people, uh, go they went worked through one or two different people that I recall. Uh, but I think that was a very good experience for them to prepare them, get, bring the momentum for their projects and prepare them for hiring a general manager. Uh, Jeannie, would you comment? Uh, yeah, I, I would uh, definitely agree that I think when approaching project management to be really honest in assessing where your strengths and weaknesses are um, and make sure you're hiring for your weaknesses. You're looking to um, bring capacity to your team. So um, being really honest in what you have on board already um, I think is really important in knowing what you need um, to look for. I mean, that's that's true with project management. It's true with um, all the positions that'll come later. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're nearing the end of our time here. I, I want a few slides towards the end that we didn't. Some were from last week or carry over that you, we were also referenced last week, but 
the just looking at energy and kind of saying how do you assess the energy of your of your effort of your individual effort and your group's effort and what can you do to build that energy to create excitement and empowerment and fun uh, through your organizing process and the way that you all have to support one another through this effort as you try to clear the hurdles and challenges that you face uh, intentionally creating a learning environment in your organization uh, practicing cooperation and mutual support and as you build your shared vision and alignment to, to celebrate that um, I want to thank uh, our participants here, Ben Sandell from the Friendly City Food Co-op. Stay tuned to future webinars that Ben will be part of. Uh, Jeannie Wells, CDS Consulting Co-op, thank you. And Joel Brock, thank you always for your technical help in fielding the questions. And uh, we look forward to hearing from any of you. If you have questions, contact us by email or telephone. I look forward to meeting you and working with you. Uh, Marilyn? Yes, Bill, thank you. I want to uh, just invite everyone to uh, register for the next four in the series of six webinars. They'll be held every Tuesday at 2 Eastern, 11 Pacific. If you haven't registered, please do. You can do that at cdsconsulting.coop. Uh, also, that the recording of today's session will be available. You'll receive a link to that in the mail within in the in email in the next few days. Uh, there will be an evaluation that will come up on your screen when you sign off today. We'd appreciate it if you take a, two, a few minutes to answer those questions. And thank you again for attending today. Best wishes in your project, and see you next week. Bye-bye.